guess you're out there somewhere. Um, I'm going to tell you a story. I don't have to see you to do that, thankfully. I'm a small town guy. I escaped from the city some 35 years ago. I went back to the land. I went back to the land in the 70s and 80s, like a lot of people. And I was there for the millennium uh, when everything was supposed to crash and didn't. And the longer I've lived there, the more I've sort of pondered the question that in this a new, expansive, global world that we live in where everything is so fast and new. What role is there for small communities? Are we becoming obscured and obsolete? And I wonder if the joys and values of small community living are still relevant and still valuable. And I guess the question is, are they still important? And is it still important to celebrate the small and the slow and the local? To explore this question, I'm going to introduce you to one small community in Virginia, my hometown, Floyd, Virginia a community that is actively engaged in finding its place in the new century. Partly, this exploration is out of economic necessity and partly uh, because we hear a call, uh, like an echo from the past. The question that we're called to understand is, can we not cash in everything that we knew, everything that we cherished, everything that we relied on? And in particular, I'll focus on the role of the, the little country store in Floyd. Located in the town, and it has served its community as a gathering place for generations. And we'll explore questions of home and community, Appalachian culture, and endurance. Will it survive? And I'll do this by presenting a set of images, a slideshow. So it's a little like going over to the neighbors on Sunday evening for barbecue and a slideshow. <clears throat> Floyd County is located in southwest Virginia in what is called the Blue Ridge Plateau. The plateau includes the highest mountains in the state and has a very uh, unique ecosystem. Floyd County, because of its topography, uh, was bypassed by a lot of the traditional infrastructure that came in the 20th century. And to this day, there are four, no four-lane roads, no railroads, no airport uh, in the county. The land is rolling and textured. 60% of it is forested. The county uh, has a contained watershed, which is a catch basin for the New River. And all the water flows west uh, and eventually ends up in the Gulf of Mexico. We are the water, the head of the watershed in Floyd County. There are limited prime agricultural soils, but there are beautiful alpine meadows and river bottoms which have been farmed for generations.
And Christmas trees uh, represent a major agricultural crop. Over 50% of our roads are deemed unimproved. 40 miles of the Blue Ridge Parkway run along the eastern edge of Floyd County. And one of the most photographed spots in the whole of the National Park System is there uh, at Mabry Mill. The Floyd Fest site uh, is at mile marker 175 and it's becoming more and more popular uh, year by year. The town of Floyd, population 450, is located at the intersection of our two major county roads and hosts our one and only traffic light, something that many people wished would not be there at all. It has been a place that has maintained a local business environment. We have a local bank, locally owned, which is amazing in this time. A citizens owned telephone cooperative. An old sewing factory, which is now a commerce center. Uh, the little town park where uh, kids come and visitors listen to music being played. And it has a, a rich alternative community. And some people joke even that perhaps Floyd should secede from the state and form its own republic. Our little community market provides space each Friday night for a craft market and Saturday for a farmer's market. And we still have a 50s drive-in restaurant that operates to this day. Our free trade, fair, fair trade organic coffee roaster, which we all know and love, and lots of small independent business. And if you should show up in Floyd on a Friday night and want a haircut, you might just end up being in the middle of a bluegrass jam. But mostly what Floyd has is an extraordinary warmth, a warmth and friendliness which emanates from a group of people who love where they live. And this is evident nowhere more than the Floyd country store. For many rural communities across America and in certainly in the southern Appalachians. The country store, the general store, has served as not only a center of commerce, but a center of culture. Places where people would gather and talk and relax with their neighbors. For decades, people would come in for supplies, sit on feed sacks and around country stores and wood, around wood stoves and exchange stories and ideas and news and songs. And particularly at the Floyd Country Store, people would exchange musical conversation, talking and hearing and rhythm. And it kept the repertoire of ballads and gospel songs alive in people's memory. The Floyd Country Store became 100 years old in 2010. Here's a picture from 1912 with the Country Store there on the left. People on horseback coming into town, some with their fiddles and banjos. And today, the uh, the store has come under new ownership. My wife and I bought the place seven years ago. And like each owner before us, we have a set of products and services uh, that match the times. And each of us has tried to 
bring what we could to the community and gave the store a new twist. It's always been a gathering place and particularly for musicians. And the old wooden floors of the store are polished with the soles of a thousand boot heels tapping out the rhythms of old time music and from the dancers that couldn't keep their seat. When my wife and I bought the store seven years ago, we heard a, a chorus of voices which said, don't change anything. It's too fragile. It's too precious. And then the building inspector showed up <laughs> who said, you have to change everything. It's so far out of code, you can't imagine. And so we took on a two-year project to expand and restore and develop the store. And with each step uh, of that process, we were mindful about our obligation because it's not just about architecture, it's about vibrations, it's about community. And I'm recalling a, a moment uh, last July that uh, accentuates this point. I came into the country store on a Saturday morning and I recognized a couple that were sitting in the booth drinking coffee and I recognized them from the night before and I went to say hello and we got into a conversation. It was an English couple from Birmingham and they were reliving a journey that they had taken 30 years before. In their youth they had traveled America and they had rented a motorcycle in Seattle and were heading to Florida and they'd been on the road over three weeks. And as we got to talking, she said, um, really, uh, uh, you know, very sadly, I, I was so afraid that I wouldn't be able to feel the way I felt about America from 30 years ago. And coming into this town last night, I found America and it was the first time and it really renewed her spirits and her faith. Some of the faces of the country store, the many fiddle players that come to town. many of them playing the instruments that they made in their garage. And um, some years ago, 2003, um, under the purview of Governor Warner's Virginia Works program, the Crooked Road organization was created and it linked together seven major venues across Southwest Virginia that embodied the history and spirit of mountain music and the Floyd Country Store was chosen to be one of those. It was the places in Virginia that would take you back and you could hear something and feel something in the history of this music. And the, and the Crooked Road today has been part of the major success of the country store because it brings visitors from all over the world and all over the country. And it supports this transition of music from young to old. In this particular case, this gentleman decided on his 99th birthday that he wanted to play music at the Floyd Country Store and here he is and we put a band behind him and he played a couple of songs 
and was delighted and said, if I live to be a hundred, I'm coming back. <laughs> and here he was on his hundredth, together with 35 of his family members who gathered around and listened. And we have lots of fun with it. We have, uh, we have people of interested in all kinds of music coming to join the show. So today the store serves uh, the community of Floyd, the visitors. Here's a guy who loves music, he just doesn't have enough hands. Um, and the store really is just an extension of what has come before. And it is, in a way, an incubator for music lessons and classes, jam sessions, and networking. And probably nowhere other than Chicago do so many people walk around with violin cases. And here's a, a picture of our Sunday jam, which goes on uh, every uh, Sunday afternoon, a free event that gathers people and an image from the early days of uh, the Friday Night Jamboree. And of course, where the music is, the dancing is soon to follow. And every Friday night, uh, there are people on the dance floor finding, renewing old acquaintances, talking to their neighbors, moving their feet, and raising their spirits. And it's a sight to see, I can tell you. And of course, the grandfathers and the granddaughters. And the country store is, is uh, also the gathering place for lots of different activities. It serves the community of course, with its lunch counter, where the menu today is um, homemade soups and salads, with entertainment, and we have concerts, and we have uh, theater, and readings, uh, and all sorts of activities, educational opportunities, and here you'll see even for those with a refined palate, you can get some potted possum. And for the young folks, lots of nice sweet things. So the store acts as a, as a, as a place for educational activities and there's many things going on in relation to workshops and classes and seed exchanges. Uh, in a way, it's sort of a library, an unofficial library for the intellectual property of the community. And here you can learn to make a quilt. And the theater, the Floyd Radio Show, practicing for their monthly airing of their variety show. and the Young Actors Co-op who perform there. And music lessons for toddlers and for the older ones. And people exchange vows at the store as part of the activities. And political rallies. We are nonpartisan, non-ideological. Everyone is welcome. And even a couple of governors get into the spirit of the thing. But more than anything else, the Floyd Country Store serves as a place to come and relax with your friends, enjoy people's company, play games, and have conversation uh, with, with folks that you know and folks that you don't know. And here's Mrs. Claus at work, and Lynn with her friends from out of town, and Leo 
uh, with some students from Virginia Tech and Kay with Leo and Karen, the town clerk, with her granddaughters and the red hat ladies and a visitor from far away and a couple of buddies hamming it up. The young, young folks out on the town and children, many children. And the Smiths who for 20 years drove from Richmond almost every week and in this picture, he was 95, she 94, and they had just driven up on their own. And as the store moves into the new century, there's the conversations are getting, getting, getting new. And the store serves as a kind of think tank for ideas and conversation groups like the New River Land Trust, the Community Foundation, many state and local agencies, tourism groups, farmers, the artisan community. They all come and find a place within the walls of the country store. And a new pulse of conversation is coming now from an organization that started three years ago called Sustain Floyd. And Sustain Floyd in many ways is an organization which is an extension of the Floyd Country Store because the mission of Sustain Floyd uh, is to protect and enhance uh, the, the uh, economic, cultural, and environmental resources of our county. The organization wants to find a way to be useful, to be a vehicle for ideas and projects. And it uses the country store uh, for its meetings and planning. For community events and for the film series that uh, we've been putting on, films, documentary films about the environment and soils and food and uh, environmental quality. And here's a film that was shown just last weekend. And each of the films is followed by a community conversation where people ask questions and share comments. And we have, we have events. Uh, Bill McKibben came. Jeff Poppin, the barefoot farmer, was there. And Sustain Floyd, from, from its place in the country store, is reaching more and more deeply into the community here, their farm to school program, where fourth graders from uh, the public schools come and plant potatoes in the spring and harvest them in the fall and, and have a local food day in the cafeteria. And Sustain Floyd operates the local market where a tasting contest is being judged by a young lady. And here we have somebody else weighing up the produce. Part of what makes the Floyd Country Store so different and important, I believe, is that it offers folks an opportunity to step out of the rat race. That is, out of the artificial world that we often build for ourselves and to feel something slightly more authentic and unpretentious. It was never intended or designed that way, but it has, over time, acquired a special patina, a collective presence from all the people who have crossed its threshold. 
who have permeated the place with their own naturalness and sincerity. Walking into the store is a way, has a way of disarming and relaxing people. And I believe it gives people space and approval to be more who they are. I remember a couple of clients of, of the lighting business came to Floyd a couple of years ago and he was a well-known uh, theater designer and did uh, a lot of work on Broadway. And he and his associate walked into the Floyd Country Store. They'd been all over the world. It stopped them in their tracks because they felt the unpretentious nature of it and were shocked by it and, and uh, were taken aback by it. Because in the new world of pop culture and pop-up ads, reality, reality TV and the 24 our news cycle, social media, and all the things that bombard us. We are pulled further and further out of ourselves, away from our inner reference points, away from silence, away from the direct experience of ourselves. Consequently, we find ourselves existing in a, often in a world of images and forms, ideas and opinions, and we lose direct contact with the subtle and immutable parts of ourselves in which our true nature resides. And whether we are conscious of it or not, we can find resonance in places like the Floyd Country Store. And it gives new meaning to our understanding of the word community. That is, to be part of an environment which nourishes and heals us. So as the sun sets on our first century and we move into the future, with all the possibilities that lay ahead, the Floyd Country Store is holding space in our frenetic world like a beacon anchored in this little village in the Blue Ridge Mountains, serving those who wish for something different, a place that allows us to remember ourselves in a different way, and hence offers texture and quality to our lives. And finally, if we return to that first question and consider the value of small community living in the 21st century, it may be that more and more people will find a need for the pace and perspectives that small towns offer. And so it's important in this world of unilateral development to protect our special places, to protect our sacred places, that they may be there when we need them, when we need them most. Thank you very much. Thank you, Woody, for helping us understand and share in your celebration of local. We look forward to continue learning from you and the good people at Crenshaw Lighting, the Floyd Country Store, and Sustain Floyd. These and the other initiatives you have shared with us strengthen community here in the New River Valley. I'm Kate Preston, a doctoral student in public administration and policy, and a member of the Community Voices organizing team. Woody, we greatly appreciate your leadership and vision for local and the importance of gathering places like the country store, where we can experience the renewed spirit of the community still vibrant in Floyd, 
Again, thank you, Woody, for being our Community Voices speaker this evening. Your talk has helped to frame the next part of our conversation this evening. Another member of our Community Voices team, John Catherine Woodgin, will engage you with some questions that will help us to look more closely at communities like ours. Thank you. I'll echo Kate's thoughts. Thank you so much for yeah. uh, sharing that talk with us. Well, I'm, I'm very happy to do it. It's, it's the thing that I love talking about most. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, just sort of a, an, some understanding of how we're going to proceed. As Kate said, we're going to have sort of a short Q&A here. And after uh, getting the conversation started, um, I'm going to open up the conversation to the group as a whole. And I invite you at that point to share any comments or questions you have. Uh, the only thing I might ask is um, for ease of hearing for everybody in the room, as well as for the fact that we're recording tonight's um, talk, I'd ask that if you'd like to share a comment or question, that um, you raise your hand, and we have some runners with these microphones, and we happy to bring those over for you so we can capture those great thoughts. Um, so, Woody, I was interested, uh, you opened your talk tonight with this wonderful image this, uh, of the map of Floyd County, yeah. and you spoke about how sort of historically, by virtue of the topography, in many ways, um, the community was able to preserve its, its sense of um, uh, local agrarian culture. As you said, no, no four-lane roads. I'm really curious about, um, uh, because of that, there are many other communities obviously throughout the country that, that have not had the same sense of preservation, um, perhaps as a result of their topography. And so I'd be, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. What could other communities learn that is those communities that, that have been highly developed or maybe lost that sense of character from 100 years ago, what could they learn about um, how to rediscover and nurture a local culture? Aren't you going to ask me a, a, a hard question? <laughs> <laughs> we'll start easy. Uh, right. Well, I, I would hasten to add that <clears throat> uh, the, the, uh, the preservation of any community um, begins at the grassroots. And I would say in the case of Floyd, it was... Uh, not something that uh, was planned or in a way was preserved. It was actually um, in a way coming to recognize that the economic strategies uh, that the community had attempted over, over the last couple of decades were not going to be useful. The, the forty percent of communities uh, in the eastern United States had an empty shell building. We weren't going to outbid um, other localities for for business. And I think that what Floyd started to do, and other communities are too, is to really begin to focus on the assets that we have. And as we looked around, what assets did we have? We had clean air, and we had relatively clean, a clean watershed. Uh, we had aesthetic quality. And we, we peeled that back sort of page by page. We found that we had this wonderful musical culture. We had a rich artisan tradition. And these were not things that were thought of as assets in the traditional economic development way of thinking. And I would just encourage communities to look deeply uh, at, at what you have that's yours, that's worth attending to. Invest in that. Uh, and I think that it... it uh, it seems obscure in the beginning, but it, 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 has, it has a way of gaining momentum. Mm -hmm. And I presume that to do so, it requires a, a good amount of sort of community solidarity to identify what those resources are, those assets, and foster them? <clears throat> well, we don't appreciate the familiar. So we don't see what is right in front of us very often. But once that process begins, it has to be a, a community dialogue. Uh, and, you know, we're very much in the throes of that right now. Uh, 
and um, it's not going to work if one group or another gets too far out ahead. Uh, we need to take a step, look around and see how our partnerships are holding up, how our relationships are developing, and um, put the ideas out constantly, you know, with ideas, without getting attached to any of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how would you describe on that topic of partnerships, how would you describe how Sustain Floyd has engaged the community? We saw some, uh, some shots of, for instance, Great. showing videos and things like that. Sustain Floyd is is really a quite an extraordinary young nonprofit. Uh, I don't know of another nonprofit in the state, or or, or may, there may not be one in the southeast, that's in a small rural community that is trying to envision and uh, create uh, ideas uh, and strategies for the future of its community the way that Sustain Floyd has. But for all of those uh, ideas, we, we, we know that we cannot think of ourselves as knowing. We have to be really good listeners. And the organization has to find a way not to simply be about ideas, mm -hmm. but implementation of projects. And a small, successful project uh, has a way of, of getting the interest of a, of a broader community. And we have been picking some projects which um, inherently involve other se sectors of the community, local government, uh, other nonprofits, the private sector. And so each project hasn't, doesn't have necessarily its own simple bottom line. Part of the reason for a project would be for relationship building. Mm -hmm. So there are multiple bottom lines in that sense. Yeah. I was particularly interested by uh, how you described the, the ways in which you kind of bridge that difference. Because Floyd, mm -hmm. just like any community, there's going to be a variety of different ideologies at play and things like that. Indeed. Um, one uh, uh, paradox that I'm sort of curious about, or what I perceive to be a paradox, is you described how the country store, um, one of its assets in many ways is that it's nonpartisan. Right. And, um, and the, but the project basis of Sustain Floyd, some could argue that there's a, there's a certain party line that would be, that, that is aligned with sort of the, the advocacy projects. Yes. Would you be willing to talk about what it takes to balance the character of the country store as well as the mission of Sustain Floyd? with the country store as the basis for that organization? We have to keep ourselves reined in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, just within the last few months, um, you know, Morgan Griffith have been to the country store. Um, and uh, a number of, uh, of Democratic candidates, we always introduce them. We think that the public is better informed if they've had a chance to meet the candidates, and we always encourage that. We've had this conversation going on uh, within St uh, Sustained Floyd as to whether or not we should be an advocacy organization, mm -hmm. whether we should take positions. And so far, uh, we, we have not come to the conclusion that that's going to be helpful in achieving our goals. Um, better to, to sort of put that to the side mm -hmm. and find ways to engage the broadest possible spectrum. So, for example, we, we uh, initiated a project to do an energy use inventory of Floyd County as a snapshot of where we were uh, last year. And um, a lot of skepticism about it, you know, what are they up to and so forth. And, um, but we worked with a lot of partners and we worked with local government and we got that inventory. We know now how much energy Floyd County uses. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a, it's, it's a, that skepticism has gone away. It's, it's, uh, it, it's something now that we can move forward with and broaden our boundaries. 
So um, in answering your question, I guess I would say that we have to put our own sense of who we are and our own sense of what we know a little bit to the side in order to be pragmatic about uh, achieving some important goals. Mm -hmm. And it strikes me just hearing that, uh, you know, you open the talk with this notion that um, there's value in honoring what's small and what's slow. And my sense is that setting up that situation of reciprocity between sustained Floyd and community members to hear across difference requires that sense of real gradual deliberation. Yeah, it's the water on rock uh, approach. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, at the same time, um, you know, you have climate change, you have food security issues, uh, there's, uh, there's wage there, there's there's wage problems in Floyd. Mm -hmm. uh, the local nuclear farm families in Floyd are are really uh, don't exist now. There's reasons to move quickly. So I guess we've just tried to keep everything fluid, not be impatient. But um, if if uh, if we kind of came to one roadblock, we would just um, find another idea and another project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. it strikes me that the orientation seems to be uh, uh, more about searching in some ways about those opportunities than necessarily planning. Would that be accurate to describe it like that? Well, it is. And um, I would say one thing about our organization is that we, we felt that, that uh, Sustained Floyd as an organization had, uh, in a way, a dual miss mission. One was to achieve some some of, of the of projects related to our mission and additionally to develop our organization in a very thoughtful introspective way that it could become embraced by the community that would would people would see that we uh, were we're trustworthy that we're a good partner and so it's the the inner growth of the community and of, of the of the organization together with the external results of our work mm -hmm. yeah so how do you see the potential for um, uh, an area with much greater size you you spoke earlier today about um, this sort of population fluctuation that's occurred in Floyd over the past several decades how it went from 15,000 down to 9,000 and then back up to 15,000 again yeah. um, since much of that trust building that you speak of, I assume, uh, comes through relationship building, how would a much, much larger area, you think, follow the same sort of process? I mean, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a question that I, I, I wished I could, could answer. Uh, I'm a small town guy. <laughs> I escaped the city 35 years ago. I, I think that um, part of why sustained Floyd works is because it has a scale onto which our efforts can be useful. And um, Floyd, uh, although it was lamented for decades that we had uh, such a meager infrastructure, uh, now it has the components which are manageable, which uh, are ripe, which are um, of a scale that a community-based organization can work with. Um, and for larger communities, I don't know, does that translate? Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, I'm not sure. Um, however, I think that the basic tenets of searching for what our assets are, searching for the community's true values, Keeping that search alive, not getting discouraged, building relationships, trying to make yourself into a good partner. Those are all things, I think, which, which can be and are exported uh, and used all over the place. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. At this point, I think we'd like to open up the conversation more broadly to the group. And so I'd invite you once again, if you have a comment or question, simply raise your hand and one of uh, the members of the Community Voices team will be happy to bring you a microphone. Yes, we have one right here. Uh, my question is, 
Uh, how aware is the uh, Floyd community about the reality of peak oil um, and how our currency system works, which is an interest-based currency system, which assumes that growth is infinite, and we know that we live on a finite planet, and um, therefore we can't, the currency system itself is not sustainable. Thank you. I think maybe I should uh, consult with Ben Bernanke about this one. <laughs> um, you, I, I, you know, what you're, what you're asking about is a question that every one of us has in our hip pocket and we carry with us. Um, we, we've talked about advocating for, for climate change policy. Uh, it's too big for us. We, we're, we're touched by it. We're, we're desperate to, to find a way to participate in that solution. And yet, um, we have to answer the question, what can one small person do? And that question turns away millions of people. But I think for, for our organization, we think we have an opportunity to do something on a local level that it may take a generation to have a ripple effect, but, it, but that doesn't keep us from needing to do it. I, I think that this issue of success and growth being seen as somehow synonymous is, is very short-sighted. Because it is a finite planet. And at the moment, we're, we need two Earths to have the resources to support the emerging middle class in China and India. And yet, we we uh, we have to just deal with our own little piece that's right in front of us, and and so we're mindful of that, um, but we don't want to be distracted by it. Yeah. One right back here. Thank you. I think it's uh, difficult to even drive through Floyd and not look at the town and point at a few things and say, how in the world did they do that? When you speak about scalable projects, things that you do that you can accomplish within your community, could you give us two or three specific examples, maybe over the last three or four years of projects that community was able to do? One of the first things that um, seemed to be possible and it turned out to be possible was the revitalization of the downtown. And uh, this was before Sustain Floyd, and a group of us, and it's a lot of the same group that sits around the table at Sustain Floyd, got together and said, we have an opportunity here to, to do a really interesting project, to invest in the community that we live in and help create the environment that we want to live in. And so we, we did, uh, together with the town and the county, uh, put some seed money in, did some grant writing, ended up with the CDBG block grant, ended up with an innovation grant, some loan pool money. And uh, because of that, uh, we built a lot of partnerships. I think right now what we're seeing um, is that things that we can do, a lot of it relates to agriculture. Floyd is a, a, a essentially an agricultural community, and it's something that people across all uh, party and ideological lines seem to be able to agree on. Would we prefer 
to be a bedroom community for Montgomery County and Roanoke County, or would we like to struggle to have our own economy, our own identity? And so we've begun with this sort of common, this common aim. And uh, we are at the moment um, taking a few steps. Uh, we have some grant money, and, and Virginia Tech has, is helping with this to develop what will probably be the first land-based learning center for young farmers uh, that's been started in the state. Um, there are people who would like to farm and make a living and, and uh, would choose that lifestyle for themselves. But short of going through the School of Agriculture uh, here, there isn't a hands-on learning center for them. And so we're, we're working on that, and that's the project that is, is having some legs. Uh, the energy inventory, as I said, uh, the uh, farm to school project, uh, Sustained Floyd wrote a grant for the, for the public schools to hire a childhood obesity specialist for the school, something which none of our neighbors had. Uh, none of our neighboring counties. So those are uh, a few things that are, it's beginning to build and the successes are, are, can, be, can be publicized and it, and it helps build um, trust in the organization. Thank you. Woody, thank you for the great presentation. I'm curious what your opinion is of tourism and its role in the sustainability of Floyd, economic sustainability, cultural sustainability, and also environmental sustainability. Thank you. Yeah, tourism. Um, yeah, big, big question. Good question. Uh, right on the money. Um, tourism is a double-edged sword. Um, and the way that we have chosen to address tourism is that it's important uh, as an economic strategy, uh, but it has the capacity to change uh, the community in a way which um, it, is, is, uh, is, would be for the worse. Our basic idea is that if we develop Floyd County for ourselves, for our families, for our children, for the community, and we make it interesting for us, that tourism will, will develop, people will want to come to Floyd, but it's not for them. It would be uh, trying to find um, uh, strategies which uh, develop it for the residents and, and, and have it in a way become interesting to visitors. I think from um, an economic standpoint, tourism is not a, um, the, the, the jobs that tourism creates are not high paying jobs. Um, Floyd is 102nd in per job wage in the state out of 105 counties. Uh, but I think what, what can happen is that we see a future in which uh, music and craft and locally owned business and destination agriculture can all come under a Floyd brand. Uh, and it supports craftspeople, musicians, farmers, and in that way to begin to build um, uh, an economy that uh, will be interesting to tourists, but will also bring them to our studios and to our, onto our farms, as opposed to us um, having to go go out. So that, that's, that's a, a, a sort of a broad plan. In terms of the environment you're asking, and it's a, it's a great question, um, every strategy needs to begin 
by saying, what is this going to do to our forests, to our watersheds, to our soils, um, and to the aesthetic quality of, of, uh, of the county? And we're trying to be mindful of that. But I, I can't say specifically how tourism would, but, but it's important to keep that in mind. Yeah. Woody, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And I'd like to thank you all thank you. for the questions that you offered this evening and for joining us for another Community Voices event. Thanks again. If we could have one more round of applause for Woody's wonderful talk this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here.